Apollo program in the 1960s. And you, you maybe, I don't know if you're old enough to remember the little things where you get the three-dimensional images by clicking through the little slide visions. Some, some of you remember this maybe. <laughs> but the way you get stereoscopic in the old day, you take two pictures and you would have to get them to line up to get that three-dimensional image into your eyes. When they put the Shroud of Turin, though, through this three-dimensional imaging machine, it generated a three-dimensional image. So that kind of shocked me. Wait a minute, we normally have to have two of these side by side to encode for a stereoscopic image. But generated from digitizing the Shroud of Turin image and extracting the three-dimensional information, they were able to do that with just one image of the Shroud of Turin, which told them that it was encoded in some way with the actual body print of Jesus. So what do we know? If it's not Jesus, who is it? Because they know it's approximately six feet tall, which was a rarity in the days of Christ. Somebody who had been scourged. They know it's somebody who had been beaten and punched, somebody who worn a crown of thorns, whose hands and feet had been nailed, who had been pierced through the side with a spear. And there's no other documented evidence of a crucified victim ever being crowned with thorns. So it's either Jesus Christ or it's a forgery. 1980, 1971 is the Shroud of Turin Research Project. 1981 is when we meet John Jackson and I start really started looking about the Shroud. 1988, again, this is before all the internet, um, they had a story came out all around the world that they had carbon dated the, the, the Shroud of Turin, taking three samples, given it to three different labs around the country. They all came together, a German, a British, and an American guy, and they said, nope, we carbon dated this to 1260, 1390. It's a medieval forgery. And, you know, me and uh, Patty and a lot of people were like, wow, I really thought that was the very cloth of Christ. I guess, I guess it's a fake. Wow, I kind of feel cheated. So that's what happens in 1988, summer of 1988. But then the carbon-14 dating starts to fall apart because, again, people who study the Shroud of Turin, and if you go to these websites I'm talking about, they have an exposition every year where people contribute papers on every kind of aspect you can think about this, from thermonuclear dynamics, how the flash occurred, to the pollen, to every magical thing you can do. So they started disputing the results on a number of different levels. We just saw a movie last night that said the reason was is they cut they cut it off with the wrong piece of the cloth. If you I think well, you can't really see it, but in the top right of that full picture of the shroud down there, there's a there's where they cut it off. And you remember I told you the shroud had been through three fires. The, the poor sisters of Claire in the fire in the 15th century actually put a cloth behind it and they rewove the outer edges. So there's cotton thread mixed in with the linen. Uh, that's one theory, that somehow that got contaminated. But I think the one that makes the most sense to me is they've actually taken linen wrappings of Egyptian mummies and they, they give radiocarbon dates that are a thousand years younger than for the body that they cover. You know, they can go to Egypt and they know by based on the dynasties when this guy died, when this guy died, when this guy died. And they're all wrapped in linen, which is what Jesus was wrapped in in the Shroud of Turin. It's made from flax. And they, they routinely give off wrong information. They know how old the body is, and the linen cloth is younger. And they've even done it even on things like uh, uh, ibis birds that were sacred to the Egyptians were mummified, and the ancient linen wrappings of one of the birds they tested was 550 years younger than the age of the bird. So linen age cannot be determined by carbon dating. In fact, there's an error anywhere from 500 to 1,000 years. That's just one way you can dispute the carbon-14 date test. And I can go on with a number of other ones, but I don't have all day. <laughs> um, so, it's again, it's either a forgery, that a forger had to be pretty clever about, right, in the 13th or 14th century. It had to know about photography when photography didn't exist. It had to know about pollen when we didn't know about pollen. It had to know about how to scorch the top of a linen cloth that they can't even do today. But the thing for me, personally, that makes this, uh, the linchpin for me is what I'm going to talk about next year. I don't know how many of you heard of the sidereum face cloth of the man in the shroud. Remember I told you there was a linen cloth amongst the face set away? Well, it turns out that that has its own little history, and we're going to talk about that as well. And between the two of them, you, you really have to stretch to say that the Shroud of Turin is, is a forgery, because you have to explain the sidereum cloth, which is in Oviedo, Spain. And it makes its journey, again, Jerusalem, and it goes to Alexandria, where there's a great Christian center there in Alexandria. 
And it was kept there and it called a chest of relics. Have any of you been? You priests been to Oviedo, Spain? Okay. That's, that's my next pilgrimage. So if any of you want to go, you let me know. <laughs> um, so there was a great chest of relics there. And I encourage you to Google this up sometime, the chest of relics from Oviedo, because there's, there's things in there that will stretch your faith, believe me, about what they carried in the chest of relics. But we know it was there in Alexandria. Again, the Muslims invade, and they bring the chest of relics for safety into Cartagena, Spain, another great Catholic center, in about the year 790 or so. But then the Muslims cross here, and they start taking over Spain, and it moves from here to Holy Toledo, so all the way up to Oviedo, Spain. Okay, that's where Holy Toledo came from. Holy Toledo, Spain. So we're way up here in Oviedo, Spain now. The Sidarium has been to that chest of relics, along with other relics, since the year 800, roughly. They said the Shroud of Turin was a forgery and it came from 1260. All right. The Sidarium is exhibited three times a year in Oviedo, Spain. They do it at Mass at Easter, they bring it out. And then, uh, like I said, it's been there since 800, and it left Palestine in 614 when the Persians invaded Alexandria. Now here's the interesting thing. The markings match the face, face image of the Shroud of Turin. I'll show you a picture of this in a moment. It has puncture marks from a crown of thorns, was placed over the face for the trip from the cross to the tomb, and has the same blood type and pollen from Palestine as the Shroud of Turin. It's been there since 800. So what that means is, at some point, the Sidarium and the Shroud of Turin had to be in contact with the same individual. And yet the Shroud's a forgery from 1260, according to some, from the Garden 14 dating test. If you go to Oviedo, it's got a beautiful church. It's on the end of the walk of St. John, if you ever want to do that. And it was built in the 8th century just for this chest of relics. And it's been there ever since. And they do bring it out. And when they bring it out, it's processed like this. And, and, and again, it covered, I'm not going to go through how it does that, but it, it basically covers the, the head bone like this. This, is, this would be the, the back and the front of Jesus, and it was wrapped around his head. So you can see how, how large it was. And then when you line up the Shroud of Turin with the cloth of Oviedo, uh, they were able to determine about 150 of the same kind of points of, of blood and markings of dirt and all kinds of things. So they basically were on the same individual at one point in time. Nobody can really dispute that. In fact, uh, about 10 years ago, somebody, Ray Rogers, if you Google his name, he was actually an atheist who was out to prove the Shroud of Turin was wrong, stumbled into the cloth of Oviedo and says, the Sidereum of Oviedo shows all the physical, and he's a chemist, and chemical properties of a very old sample of lemon. There is a finite probability that the Sidereum is related in time and location to the Shroud of Turin. That's as far as he would go. But that says quite a bit. In 2002, they, uh, they removed the patches on the shroud and removed some of the dark carbon from the fires and, uh, and the backing cloth, and they treated it with thymol, uh, which is now contaminated the shroud to some degree. So um, they really can't do any more scientific testing on it. Uh, they've got some ideas. Who knows? They may come up with something they want to try at some point. But as it stands right now, there has been no testing on it um, since that time. As uh, Father Waltz mentioned, we went uh, five years ago. At that time, it was called Passio Christi, Passio Ominis, uh, the Passion of Christ, the Passion of Man. That was the, uh, the look then. Uh, that's what the church looks like when you go. You'll, you'll see that. That's the Church of St. John. And again, the Mass. Uh, we showed you that earlier. And that's kind of a view of the Shroud. It's on exhibit till June 24th. This is this year's uh, symbol. I don't know if you've seen this yet but it's uh, L'Amore Più Grande uh, and Sindoni. Well, now, I, I kind of had a revelation here. I've been looking at the shroud. You know, when you go to Italy, this is what they call it, the Sindoni, uh, the sacred cloth. And it, it, what does that look like in English to you? Sindon. Kind of makes sense, right? <laughs> Once Christ died for us, our sins were forgiven, Sindon. So it works in English, too. <laughs> You all have little passes like this, I hope, right, Father? Mm -hmm. Yep, you get a little pass, it has your name, what time you get to go, and the number of people in your party. Eight was the maximum number, luckily that's all we had this time, with the six kids. It is the, the most studied relic in the world, with hundreds of scientists trying to solve how it was formed. Again, Shroud.com is the place to go. I've got a couple other things, and I'll take some questions. 
Uh, the other thing you have to think about, this was, this is a, photo a photograph. This is a photograph of Jesus. It's in reverse. And so when you think about that, <laughs> Jesus did the first selfie. 2,000 years ago, and it was a doozy. <laughs> We're still talking about it. <clears throat> How many people talk about yourself is more than like a day, maybe, right? And here's the other interesting thing I want to leave you with, too, is there have been a number of saints associated with this. Uh, Father Waltz mentioned a, a couple of them were very devoted. But this, this saint's kind of, uh, has, has got me very interested. Oh, she's not a saint yet, she's blessed with uh, Maria uh, Perino, I think is how you say that. Do you, any of you guys familiar with that? Any priest here? Uh, she uh, has got an interesting story. She was uh, born near Milan, uh, so near where you're going to be, and she became, uh, she started having, a, she's a mystic, she started having visions of the Blessed Mother and Jesus, and she was told, uh, and her bishop supported this, to go and uh, start the devotion of the Holy Face. And when you're at the Shroud of Turin, there's a, the only place I would suggest you buy your, your trinkets from Turin is at this shop about a block away that the nuns run. It's called the Apostolo something. Uh, Apostolo will be catching up. It's just about a block away from the Shroud of Turin. And uh, we, we, I talked to a nun about this, and she was, she was very into it as well. And it's the, it's the devotion to the Holy Face, and it's, uh, it's feast day is actually the Tuesday before Ash Wednesday. And you do a, a novena, and uh, this, this woman has had some amazing experiences. She died in 1945, uh, so right at the end of, well, towards the end of World War II, and uh, Pope Benedict uh, uh, blessed her in 2010. So, um, and she has a, a remarkable story, and, and it's, it's kind of like, almost like Sister Faustina, which brings me to this picture as well. I don't know if you guys have seen this kind of move today at all. Can you see that? Can I do that? You got the Shroud of Turin, right? Anybody want to know where that face comes from? Any guesses? Divine Mercy. It matches up perfectly with the Divine Mercy image. In fact, there was a road show not too long ago went on the Catholic churches and showed the entire image uh, and, and uh, the face of Jesus with Divine Mercy. It matches up perfectly. So that's, that's kind of an interesting thing as well. And I, I think uh, Blessed Maria has a story very similar to Sister Faustina in trying to bring this devotion uh, forward. So hopefully with her beatification, that'll start that process in earnest. I have some books and things outside you're welcome to get. Everybody always asks me what the best book to read is. This one's pretty old. Like when I was used to do the talk show on Cape Fire back in the 1990s, I had to work on a Good Friday. Not only I worked for the states, they give us Good Friday off. So that's a good deal. But uh, I always was determined on the talk show to talk about something related to Good Friday, and I often would find people who had written books about the Shroud of Turin and talk about them. So they <coughs> sent me the book. I get to read the book and interview. It was like the dream job, right? So this book was written back in 19... 98, so that during that exhibition of 1998. And this gentleman here um, doesn't talk much about the carbon 14 days test, but he was an attorney, he's an atheist, and he wanted to determine to prove that Shroud was false once and for all, so he's tired of hearing about it. So he uh, started writing a book. He, he threw out the carbon 14 dating test before anybody disputed it because he said, as an attorney, if you have 100 pieces of evidence and one piece of evidence doesn't make any sense. You don't consider that one to discount the other 99 pieces that you have. You know, it's a preponderance of the evidence. And in this case, the preponderance of the evidence is its authenticity, not that it's failed the carbon-14 dating test. So we ended up writing a book and taking you through the history. It's fairly short. Uh, it's called The Mystery of the Shroud of Turin. And John Iannone is, is, is the name. And it's a pretty short book, good read, and gives you all of the facts and information about it. Well, I'm at 40 minutes, so I got five minutes for questions, I guess. <laughs> so you, you talk about the flash. Yeah. Can, can you sure. explain that a little bit? Yeah, I kind of, I, you know, I kind of gloss over a lot here. Um, you know, you're going to be on the plane for a long time, so if you can, you know, get some of these movies on YouTube and put them on your devices and read them, because there's a lot of good stuff out there. <laughs> 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 Wait, I'm, oh, you're on the plane, right? Okay, well, before you leave, which you went tomorrow, <laughs> No, the, it's interesting, it's kind of a, from what I, I'm not a scientist, so I'm, I'm coming at this from the labor of explaining to you, but they believe there was some radi radiative scorch that took place. So when Jesus resurrected, he literally burned, you know, out in out of time, you know, and, and left 